Well, thank you, Jamie. Indeed, I know that Anita would be the first one to say and to agree with me that while it is true, she has a major role in all of the good things that go on with our children, she is assisted by a lot of other people, such as Jamie Burns and Jane Fry and others that I see here. Uh, our church invests in our children I am pleased to be a part of that. Let's look, if we may, today on this second Sunday of the Easter season with resurrection in the air. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We will read together verses 13 through 18. And while you are finding that, I just want to take a moment, if I may, and pat our congregation on the back. I had a family tell me in the early service that they had been on vacation the past week, that they left for vacation after worship last Sunday, and they came back from vacation in time for worship this Sunday. There is someone else in our sanctuary today who has done something similar, and I know that many of you are trying to make this a habit in your own lives. And I just want to say to you how much that thrills me as your pastor. We have a good church here. We have a strong church here. And I think we're going to come out of COVID stronger than when we went into COVID. At least that is my prayer. In order for us to maintain a strong church in a husky, it's going to take a little bit more work than if we were in Raleigh. That is just the reality of our situation. So I thank you, all of you, who are committing to the wealth and to the health of our congregation. I am inspired and I am thrilled to be your pastor. So let's read together, shall we? The Apostle Paul says that we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God, and shall we pray. Oh God, indeed, you are magnificent. You are so good to us. And I know enough of the stories of the people who are gathered now underneath the sound of my voice. I know that some of our folks are doing quite well, that life is relatively smooth for them. And I know that other of our people are not doing so well, that they're struggling with finances, or they're struggling with sickness, or they're grieving the passing of a loved one. But, oh God, all of us, no matter how our individual lives are, we gather collectively and we sing your praises indeed for what you have done for us through your Son, Jesus the Christ. And it is Christ that unifies us together. We have unity in the midst of our diversity. And teach us now, as we continue to consider resurrection hope. And it is in the name of Jesus, oh God, oh perfect God. It is in the name of Jesus that we make this prayer unto you now. Amen. It is very important to me that you get the point of my sermon today. 
I'm not suggesting that this wasn't important to me last Sunday. And if the Lord tarries, it will be important to me next Sunday that you get the point of my sermon. But today, it is, for whatever reason, especially important. So I have no fancy stories. I have no illustrations. I bring to our pulpit today very little sophistication. Instead, I bring to our pulpit to get today direct communication. And here is my point. Here is what I want you to get. Here it is. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so will Jesus' followers be raised from the dead. That's it. That's the point. That's what I want you to take home with you. If you're in the habit sometimes of discussing the pastor's sermon over lunch, I'd like you to discuss this over lunch. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so will God raise Jesus' followers from the dead. My experience with the Christians that I've hung out with through the years is that we tend to emphasize Jesus' resurrection, especially on Easter Sunday, but even during other times of the year. But there is little emphasis. We tend not to accent our own resurrection, the general resurrection of the dead. Do you remember the Apostle Paul's words from a couple of weeks ago when we were doing all this baptizing? From Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, Therefore we have been buried with Christ through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now verse 5. For if we have become united with Christ in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be united with Christ in the likeness of his resurrection. So indeed, this idea of the resurrection of the body. It is a crazy idea. I'm going to conceive that today. It is an incredible idea. Some folks would think we're crazy for holding on to these kinds of beliefs in our modern age. But I continue to maintain them, and I suspect you do too, at least to a certain degree. The idea of resurrection is central to Christian faith. The idea of Jesus' resurrection is central to Christian faith. As I said to you last Sunday, if Jesus' resurrection isn't so, then let's lock up shop and let's go home. What are we doing here? Why did I get up at quarter to six this morning if Jesus' resurrection didn't occur? If it didn't occur, I'm going to sleep in on Sundays. If it didn't occur, I'm going to cut my grass on Sunday mornings. I'm going to do what all the other secular people do with their time on Sunday mornings. In fact, I'm going to meet them for coffee. So Jesus' resurrection is central to Christian faith. However, so is my resurrection, and so is your resurrection. So is this broader concept, you see, of the resurrection of the dead. Isn't it interesting that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, here the Apostle Paul does not discuss Jesus' resurrection. He discusses that elsewhere. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is discussing your resurrection and my resurrection and, of course, the Thessalonians' resurrection. It seems that as we look at Paul's time in Thessalonica from the book of Acts, Paul was in Thessalonica for three weeks. Thessalonica is in modern-day Greece. He was run out of Thessalonica. He ends up in Corinth in Greece. He sends Timothy to check on the church that he had founded in Thessalonica. And Timothy comes back and says to Paul, Hey Paul, those Thessalonian Christians, they're doing well. 
The heat was turned up on us when we were there. We had to leave town, but they are standing for Christ. However, they do have a question. And it appears that the Thessalonians had misunderstood Paul, or as sometimes happens with we teachers, we just weren't as clear as we should have been. And when Paul was with the Thessalonians, no doubt he preached his strong belief, his eschatological belief in the return of Jesus. The Apostle Paul believed that Jesus was going to return very soon. This Old Testament concept of the day of the Lord, uh, Jesus' prayer that God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, this concept that at some point in the future, God's going to intervene. God's righteousness is going to reign. God is going to make all the evils right. All the injustices are going to become just. God is going to kick evil out. No more sexism, no more racism, no more child abuse, no more early death because of cancer, no more none of that stuff. And when the day of the Lord comes, Jesus is going to return. Paul thought that was going to happen very soon. In fact, as we'll see here, he thought it was going to happen in his own lifetime. And so he preached that to the Thessalonians. Well, reading between the lines, as we have to with Scripture sometimes, oftentimes, it appears that after Paul left the Thessalonians, Uncle John died. And then Aunt Sally died. And the Thessalonians had questions. Well, Paul, what happens to Uncle John? What happens to Aunt Sally? They have already died before the day of the Lord, before the return of Christ. Are they going to miss out on something when Jesus returns? Are they going to miss out on a key part of the party? And Paul writes back from Corinth. And he says to the Thessalonians, he says, oh, no, 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 you misunderstood me. No, no, no. Uh, Uncle John and Aunt Sally, they're going to be fine. Let me tell you what is going to happen. And so notice verse 14, if you will, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and there it is, church, that's the centrality of who we are. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. That's the literal Greek. It's a beautiful metaphor that Paul uses for death, that the death of the Christian is falling asleep. Now verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. And notice this, church, this is very interesting. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Notice that in this writing, Paul still includes himself in the group of people that will be alive when Christ returns. He's still thinking when he writes to the Thessalonians sometime in the 50s, Paul is still thinking that he's going to be alive when Christ returns. Now, by the time we get to the Philippian letter, Paul's going to adjust his thinking there. And he's going to say, well, maybe I'm going to pass away first, as in fact we know did happen. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17. Here it is again. Then we who are alive, Paul says, and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So Paul says to the Thessalonians, right? He says, look, here's what's going to happen. Now, here's the million dollar question that I would love to have an answer to, and I don't know the answer. I want to know where Paul gets his ideas from. Where, where did Paul hear this? Or did it come by direct revelation, as he speaks of in the Corinthian correspondence? I don't know what he doesn't say. It's a question that has fascinated me for years. Whatever the case, Paul says, look, 
When the day of the Lord comes and God makes everything right, don't we thirst for that? Don't we hunger for that? Don't we yearn for that? When everything is made right in Christ's return, Paul says that those who have died in Christ will be raised first. So Uncle John, who is in a casket or in a tomb somewhere, and Aunt Sally, who's in a tomb somewhere, Uncle John and Aunt Sally, Paul says, look, they're okay. They're not going to miss out on anything. When the day of the Lord comes and Christ returns, as crazy as it sounds to our ears, Uncle John and Aunt Sally, though their bodies may be decayed back to dust, it doesn't matter. God is going to raise those bodies from the dead. And they're going to go and meet Christ. And then after that, those of us, Paul says, who are alive, then we will be caught up together with Uncle John and Aunt Sally to meet Christ in the air. And so, it's going to to be fine. And isn't it interesting here, church? Here, well, but Paul does say something about Jesus' resurrection. In fact, he does. But his emphasis is on the resurrection of Uncle John and Aunt Sally. Of my resurrection and of your resurrection. The resurrection of the dead. It is the centerpiece of our hope. And there are practical applications for this. Notice verse 13. Paul says, he's got a pastor's heart. Paul had a pastor's heart. And he says, oh goodness, <clears throat> you've misunderstood me. Or maybe I didn't speak clearly enough. Or maybe I misspoke. I don't know, but verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep. So that you will not grieve as to the rest who have no hope. And so we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. When someone dies, they are okay. The dead is fine. It is those of us that are left behind that grieve and need comfort. And our resurrection hope and our resurrection faith is, in fact, what comforts us. So here's my experience. Um, based on my understanding of Paul and early Christian writers. When I stand over a casket or an urn that holds the remains of a cre cremated deceased Christian, or I stand over a casket, or I officiate a memorial service for a deceased Christian, I always think to myself, to be continued. Elsewhere, Paul is going to talk about, in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about the nature of the resurrected body. And he says it is sown a physical body and it is raised a spiritual body. Much like the account of Jesus' resurrection and appearance that Peggy read earlier, clearly it was Jesus' body that was raised, but it was changed because he's walking through walls and, you know, it's a different sort of body. Through the years, early on in my journey, I was skeptical uh, that I was going to know my father after death. Now you hear this and you don't want to bust anybody's bubble because it's so comforting to people. But you hear folks say, well, you know, mama's dead, I'll see her later. Uh, you know, you, you, you bury your spouse of 62 years and you say, well, uh, Tom, I'll see you in a few. I don't know, I, I've often wondered, I mean, really? Where does that come from? Not that I wasn't attracted to the idea, but I mean, is that something to believe? But the older I get, and the more I consider this idea of resurrection, I think it's quite possible. And that that is how we recognize one another. <laughs> how would you recognize one another without some sort of body? But it's a resurrected body, like Jesus' body, that is raised from the dead, and
and then it is changed. So when I stand over a casket, I think to be continued. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So in some sense, I assume, when we die, we are with God. But that's not, the best is still yet to come with the resurrection of the dead. It's why some Christian groups, uh, traditionally we Baptists have been held to this belief, and it's not my personal belief, but some Christians believe in this idea called soul sleep, which is that when you die, you just rest until you are raised. I mean, I, I can see that. But, but Paul does say that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I assume that when we die, we are with God in some sense. But to be continued, there's more to come when the day of the Lord arrives. This day that we yearn for, when God makes everything right. God intervenes in ordinary history, and He makes everything right, and suffering is no more. Injustices are rectified. No early death. No murder. No drug overdose. No suicide. You name it. None of it. And when Christ returns on the day of the Lord, I know it sounds a bit wacko, but I'm perfectly comfortable saying it up here. I know it sounds a bit crazy. I know it may stretch your intellect. But I'm perfectly comfortable saying it up here. That at the day of the Lord, our bodies, no matter how decayed, no matter whether they're cremated or not, no matter whether they're intact or not, by the power of God, our bodies, our decomposed bodies, whatever, they are put back together. They are raised. And the part of us that is with God before the resurrection is reunited to those bodies. Now, I think that's Paul's understanding. I think that's rather consistent throughout Scripture. We Christians tend to be more platonic in our view of death. And we tend to think, okay, Uncle John has died, and now Uncle John is with God, Uncle John is in heaven, Aunt Sally dies, and Aunt Sally is with God, and Aunt Sally is in heaven, and Uncle John and Aunt Sally are together. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we stop there. That's not fully Christian. Partially Christian. Very platonic, that is, these are the ideas that Plato had, where the soul leaves the body, and the soul leaves the body because the body is no good, and the body just decomposes and disintegrates, so there's no use for the body. But Jews and Christians come along and say, no, 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 no. Jesus was raised from the dead. That changed everything. And Thomas and others saw him in his resurrected state. Jesus was raised from the dead. And therefore, you too, me too, our bodies will be raised on the day of the Lord and the return of Christ. I don't like you to think about that. I really do. This Easter. Not only think about Jesus' resurrection, but think about your own resurrection and the resurrection of your deceased loved ones. Ponder that. And I'm already a really happy pastor today. Because I've had people in both services tell me, I came back in town for worship today. I'm already a really happy pastor today. But it would make me even happier if you all would discuss this over mine.